thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Title of my message this morning is, For they that be with us are more. For they that be with us are more. And we're going to come from the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings, Haley, chapter 6, verse 15. 2 Kings, chapter 6, verse 15. Isn't it refreshing to be in the house of God? Hallelujah. To worship him because he's worthy. That, that song kept saying, the lamb that was slain. The lamb that was slain. Michelle, we have access to everything that God has for us because of the lamb that was slain. Not because of anything that we have done or not have done. So I want to remove that lie. I feel like, honestly, as I went through these, these, this book and these chapters, that the enemy has been lying to us over and over again to get you to come short of the promises of God. And this morning, I believe that God wants you to walk in the sphere of his faithfulness. God has been faithful time and time again, and he is not going to stop being faithful because faithful is who he is. And he's not a God that he shall lie, and he will not fail you. And the enemy will lie to you. Your own emotions will lie to you. Your mind will lie to you and tell you that you're not going to make it and tell you that you've fallen too far or the trial is too hot that you cannot bear it. But my God said that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever and that he is not going to change. And his word that was true for Elijah and Elisha is the same that is true for you, Sabrina. He is not a respecter of persons, Robert. He is going to show up the same way that he did for those of old for us today. And our job is to believe it. You believe it and you receive it. And you walk in it. You can walk in the power of God. Today is your day. Today is your day, and I pray, this is my cry, because I've been in a, in a trial. Ever since I've been married, I've been married seven months, and it seems like the enemy has constantly bombarded my husband and I to, to divide us, to separate us, because the enemy doesn't like when the work of God is going forward. And when you say, yes, I have determined in my heart that I am going to serve the Lord get ready because the enemy is going to try to consume you using whatever he can to get your focus off track to get you discouraged and to dismantle your relationship with the Lord because that's where your power comes from but I pray that we see this morning that they that are for us are more they that are for us are more. And I'm going to explain that. 2 Kings 6 verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and had gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. That means they were completely surrounded by the enemy. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? You ever been in a trial before and wake up and say, What do we do? What are we supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with this? That's what he said. We are surrounded. We are encompassed. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And he answered, Elisha answered, this is who's speaking, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. They that are with us when God is on your side. They that are with us are more than they that be with them. 
See, Elisha had gone through some things. He had seen God work miracle after miracle. He walked in the sphere of God's faithfulness continuously. And he believed God despite the trial and despite the situation. So when those around said, what shall we do? What are we going to do? The enemy is on every side. Elisha reminded himself of the faithfulness of his God, recalled back to his mind and said, no, my God showed up then and he's going to show up now. My God showed up then and he's going to show up now, 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 show up now. My goodness, what am I supposed to do? You are to recall back to remembrance God's faithfulness. And you know what? It's not that easy when you're in the middle of the trial. It's not that easy when you wake up early in the morning and all of a sudden you are surrounded. Have you ever been through something where all of it's all of a sudden? All of a sudden, you are surrounded by that thing. It is consuming your mind, your thought, your heart. You go to work, and there it is. You get up in the morning, and there it is. You go to bed, and there it is. You are surrounded by it continuously, and you're like, God, I'm serving you. See, Elijah was a faithful man of God. He was, let me say this again, because I said this to my husband the other day. We were, we're going through something, and I just broke down crying, and I said, God, I have been faithful. I have been faithful to you. Have I done it all perfect? No. But, God, I have walked with you, and I have been faithful to you. And why? why how? What shall we do? How is this happening? Why is this happening? So don't think because you are a child of God, and we are a child of God, that we are not going to face things. God is testing us to see, are we going to stand and believe? He is building your faith. He is refining your faith. He is growing your faith. He is causing you to be more like him. He wants you to be closer to him. He wants you to rely on his faithfulness. He wants to rely, he wants you to rely on his power and his grace. And it says, Elisha prayed, oh God, let this be our prayer. And said, this verse 17, Haley, and said, Lord, that word Lord, covenant keeping God. He, he stood up and said, Lord, you are a covenant keeping God. You are a God that keeps covenant. Your covenant was cut on Calvary in the blood of Jesus. And no height, nor depth, nor principality, nor things present, nor things unseen can separate me from that covenant. Because that is my covenant. Lord, you sent your son to cut. Think about that. He sent his only son. I know it could feel Sunday school, but I pray that God opens our eyes to this thing. God, open our eyes to the fact that you sent your son to cut covenant on Calvary. The covenant was cut. The agreement was made between God and Jesus. Between God and Jesus. And when you give your heart to the Lord, you are in covenant with Jesus. And nothing can separate you from that. No failure, no mistake, no shortcoming, no doubt, nor fear. Nothing can separate you from that covenant if you continue to believe. Now, am I saying do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and you'll no. I'm saying when we fall short, you repent. A believer lives a life of repentance continuously. It's an act of worship to repent. God, forgive me for doubting you. God, forgive me for falling short. God, forgive me. I have blew it, and I blew it for a while now. God, forgive me, Lord. Here I am, no. Here I am, and you continue to believe, and he'll continue to be faithful, and his mercies are new, what? Every morning, not just Sunday morning, not just Wednesday afternoon. 
afternoon, every single morning that you place your feet upon the ground. He said, my mercy, my forgiveness, my grace is new every single morning. Every single morning. This book is written by the prophet Jeremiah. And he's writing this before the Babylonian captivity. Let me tell you this. Just because you are a child of God does not mean that our hearts cannot be taken captive by the things of this world. Our hearts can be taken captive and prone to wander, prone to leave the God that I love. Oh, Lord, God, take my heart and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Why do they write this stuff in Scripture? Just to have this, like, frilly saying? No, because our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Above all things, they will be prone to wander at a moment's notice. But God, let me tell you this. Pastor Matt preached on this last night. And those of you that weren't here, I wish you were here because it was really intense what he talked about last night. And there is this video game out. And I was, because, you know, I'm saying this because at this time period, wickedness was waxing worse and worse the leadership of that day wanting nothing to do with God and I want to tell you this leadership of this day wants nothing to do with God and God is being removed from everything from schools from from colleges from sports games we, and, and everything else is being elevated, and God is trying, and they're trying to remove God from the society. And that's what they were doing in that day. And he put up this video of this video game, and I'm just going to give this example because I couldn't believe it. It's called Cult of a Lamb, right? It's a video game called Cult of a Lamb that is geared towards children that is you get to make your own cult, and, you, yeah, you, you, there's converts, and you go and you get converts into your cult, and you do rituals and sacrifices. It's a children's game. It's a children's game, and they have all the names of the gods and the pentagram and everything in this game. It's a children's game. Look, the enemy is getting bolder and bolder and bolder. And his heart is for the next generation. The next generation because he's trying to remove God from society now, which was going on in that time, to take God's people captive. And he's starting now on the young. And if we as believers and leaders and mothers and fathers and grandparents don't have eyes to see the enemy, then the enemy can sneak in and he can steal the next generation. And God can be removed more and more and more. The nation at this time was on a decline and idolatry was coming in. That means everything else was being placed before God. They were worshiping other gods. I remember, and I'll talk about this because this is something that happens in my home, when sports events for children were not on Sundays. I asked my mom, I said, did I used to play sports on Sundays? Because I don't remember playing sports on Sundays. She said, no, we never did sports on Sundays. But now, and this, listen, my, our, my stepchildren, they all are in sports. I'm not saying anything about sports. But I'm saying when it begins to consume your life, you can't even show up to church because you're in traveling baseball or traveling dance or traveling whatever. And you begin to replace that thing, with, place, replace the Lord with whatever that thing is then God begins to be removed from your life little by little. And then one day you look up and then all the Sundays are gone. All the time with the Lord are gone. All you're equipping are children that are facing a cult of a lamb in the next generation are gone. And we're not doing as leaders what we're supposed to be doing for our children and protecting them and putting in them what they need to walk this thing out. Look, it's hard enough for us. Can I, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Is it hard enough for us as adults to, Jess said to me yesterday, this Christianity thing, this is hard. And she ain't lying. 
She's not lying, but you know what? There is a power in us that is greater than the power out there. And they that are for us are more. They that are for us are more. So the main purpose of this book is, one, to remind the people to adhere to God's word. When God's word begins to be removed out of our lives, that's when the enemy can have free reign to come in. Listen, all of us are busy. I understand that. I was an instant wife and an instant stepmom of three. Busy, run my own business in ministry. I understand (laughs) what busy looks like. But you know what the Lord showed me the other day? Something happened between, I'm just being real if I can. Something happened between my husband and I, and we were going at it. And the Lord spoke to my heart because the next morning Jeff woke up and he began to pray over me and sing over me. And the Lord said, Remember, that's first. Remember, that's first. Because look, I'm a go getter. I'll get up in the morning and all of a sudden laundry will be done and all this stuff will be done and then I'll go to work. And you know what? We tend to miss that sweet time with the Lord. We tend, listen, if you're a night owl like Naya and you want to sit with them then, go ahead. But if you're in the middle of the day when you go to lunch, you want to sit with them then. If you're a morning person and you want to get up and rise up early in the morning, sit with them then. But you know what God does in those times? He begins to remind you, one, of his faithfulness. Two, he He begins to open up your eyes to the things that are actually going on in your life. Like why they're going on or what is going on. Or remind you of who he is so you continue to go in that direction and believe him and trust him. He just washes over you with a refreshing. But if we miss it, then we start to dry up. And we start to let the enemy come in. So God in those times wants us to adhere fast, give our loyalty to the word of God. God, I'm going to remember your word and I'm going to apply it to my life. And then he wants us to walk in his covenant and his faithfulness. I got this hula hoop. It's a little small. So Robert, this hula hoop, no. (laughs) But God's got a big hula hoop for you. God's faithfulness. You stay in the sphere of God's faithfulness. Don't step out of the sphere of God. Don't don't let the enemy remove you where you're riding the line to believe in how faithful God is. Once you step in his faithfulness, stay in the sphere of his faithfulness. Hold on to his faithfulness. If I could do it, I would. I can't. But stay here. Don't move. If you need him to expand your borders of his faithfulness, he will expand and expand and expand and expand. Because his faithfulness is true. And he will continue to be faithful. Now let me, I'm going to go through this real quick. You ready, Haley? (laughs) Second Kings. 1-6, 2 Kings 1-6, the condition of God's people at this time. I'm going to show you some things with Elijah and Elisha, the trial and God's faithfulness. What do I want to talk to you about? The trial and God's faithfulness. I know it sounds simple, but the trial and God's faithfulness, because those that are for us are more. The pattern that we see continuously through the book of 2 Kings is the trial in God's faithfulness. So first we see this, the death of King Ahab. He is a wicked king who has married Jezebel. Jezebel is a woman who has brought an alienation to the faith. Jezebel is a spirit of today. And she wants you to alienate your faith. She wants to turn your heart to other things. And she does it by the sin of tolerance. Let me say this again. She does it by the sin of tolerance. She wants you to begin to tolerate that which is wrong. 
and say that which is wrong is good and that which is good is wrong. See, if we begin to allow some things into our life, I'll just use something like lying, for example. And we lied once. We feel convicted, but we then we begin to lie again. And we begin to lie again. And then all of a sudden we begin to have a lifestyle where we are a liar. So tolerating sin in whatever form it is will eventually bring you into bondage. Will it eventually lead to the death of your spirit? It will be, bring death to your relationship. The wages of sin is death. The wages, the payment for your sin is death. Sin separates us from God. So if sin is not dealt with and we tolerate it, we allow it into our home, we allow it on our TVs, we allow it into our ears, we allow it into our even our mind and our heart, if we allow it into our children, God will deal with us. But the tolerance will be bring us once captive. And that's what happened with the children of Israel. That's why they went into Babylonian captivity. Because they actually tolerated and the leadership of the day made covenant with Jezebel, became one with Jezebel. See, if we become one with being tolerant, we will death will come into us and our families. God doesn't want Christians who ride the line. They want, he wants Christians who follow truth. And Jezebel allowed this in. Ahab went along with her. Men of God, stand up for what is right. Stand up for truth. Stand up, women of God. Do not allow things into our children's homes and lives. I don't care what their best friend down the street and that family is doing. That they're not your responsibility. Your responsibility is the sphere that God put you in with your children and your household and your place and your workplace. And those are the people that you are responsible for and that I am responsible for. Because I can't go where Naya goes and Naya can't go where I go even though we try as much as we can. I can't go where Pastor Matt goes and wash the man's feet with maggots in them. Yeah, Pastor Matt, wash the man's feet. With maggots in them. Could we say that for ourselves? But God used him to minister to that man. But I wasn't there to do that. That was who he was responsible for. And God places people in our lives that we are responsible for. But I see Ahab, he could have stood up for truth. He could have began to follow Jehovah. See, Jehovah's voice was not silent during that time. He was still calling his people. Elijah was still seeing miracles happen. And Elisha was still along his side. But, the, but Ahab decided, I'm going to tolerate and annihilate what I have seen and I'm going to go in this direction and the people become slaves to that and then Ahab dies and Moab is it rises up and the Moabites come against Israel and King Uzziah all of a sudden we see King Uzziah come into play and he falls through a lattice and gets sick listen to this he inquires of Beelzebub. And his Beelzebub is a god of that time who is named the Lord of the Flies, who can drive out a plague and has the power to send it away. That was who they thought it was. He could drive out a plague and have power to send it away. God always, ha I mean, the enemy always has a counterfeit. See, God. <laughs> Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he is the only one who has the power to drive sickness out, to drive bondage out, to free you from the reigning of sin in your life. But, but there's always a counterfeit. 
well, you can just go do this drug or that drug or, or do this with that man or that with that woman. Or you can go do this and worship another God, do another thing, and maybe you'll get help there or maybe you'll get help there. And that's what he did. He inquired. He went to another God. That, that word inquire meant he treaded frequently. What are we treading frequently to? Where are we going frequently to get relief? Where are we going frequently to get healing? Where are we going frequently to, to, to settle down? Where are we going frequently to find rest or refuge or strength? Look, I love my husband, but I can't find it in him. I can, I can to a degree, but I can't find it for my soul in him. I need the Lord to touch my soul. I need the Lord to change my crazy way of thinking at times. Yeah, you know we can get out there. Listen, the enemy will attack your mind. That is a battlefield that only Jesus can bring your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Only Jesus can settle your heart down in the midst of a trial that you are facing. And look, these kings, they all had it wrong. And you know what? The nation followed them. The nation followed them. That's what's going on right now. Is the nation is following a leader that wants to remove God from everything. We have exalted other gods, and we see the manifestation in it. We can see the manifestation. I mean, that game itself speaks volumes of the tolerance of society. When we are teaching children how to worship Satan and sacrifice to idols, And Elijah shows up on the scene, and he says this. Thus says the Lord, this is 2 Kings 1, 6. It is not because there is not a God in Israel. So he states, this is not happening because God is not real. How many times have we heard that? Why does God allow this? Or why does God allow that? And that's people's arguments a lot of the time. If God was real, then this wouldn't happen. If God was real, then that wouldn't happen. And he says, thus said the Lord, it is because God, it is not because there is a God in Israel that thou hast sent us to inquire inquire Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. He's saying, look, you're inquiring or treading or worshiping the wrong God. He's not, God of Israel has not come to deliver you or answer you because that's not who you're going to. And he says, no, we can take that for ourselves, y'all. Who are we going to? Who are we inquiring of? Why have I not seen it yet? Why have I not seen it yet? And he says, thou shall not, remember he fell through the lattice, he was sick. He said, look, you're not going to. You're not going to come off your bed. You shall die. Because of where he was going to find his refuge and strength, he was going to die in that place. First comes spiritual death. Then will come a natural death. And Pastor Matt did a real good job at explaining what it's going to look like if we don't receive Jesus and we have to go to hell last night. And that's the reality, and I'm not trying to, like, scare nobody, but this is happening in our society. And we have to be awake to what is going on in our society. The voice of of God is not silent today. He is still calling through his prophets. He is still calling through his preachers. And you know what? He should be still calling through you. We should be going to work and our jobs and taking responsibility for the souls of those around us and ministering with our words, ministering with our walk, ministering with our lifestyles, ministering to our children, ministering to them. They see us all the time, the good, the bad, 
the ugly, but you know what? That's okay because this is real life and this is real Christianity and our kids even need to see what a life of repentance looks like. What a life of maybe struggle at times looks like. What it looks like for mama or daddy or grandpa or grandpa to be broken before the Lord. To know what it's like when there's no money in the bank account and you got to believe God for something to work a miracle. When there's, no, when there's no one around you and it's just you and you feel like you've lost all your friends. Look, our children go into public schools, believe in the gospel, and a lot of our youth, has told us there is no one there that believes like we do. That is a lonely place, especially for us as adults. Y'all ever feel like that? I don't have nobody to talk to. I mean, we come here and it's one thing. But to go and to talk up to, about the Lord and to believe the way that you do on your job or in public. How about a, a baseball game or a or a softball game, or something that y'all go enjoy with your grandkids or kids. Like, no, there's barely anybody. You feel isolated. And our children got to know what they need to do to continue to walk with the Lord in a society that is believing like that. When Johnny down the street is playing that video game, and they're sitting next to them in school, what does that look like? And when everybody rejects them and laughs at them for loving Jesus, what does that look like? How can we teach them those things? Because God is not silent in society today. He's still calling for his people. And we see now in the midst of a godless generation, two of the most mighty men, Elijah, which means Jehovah is God, and Elisha, which means God is my salvation. This, their names represented who they were. God, let us be a representation. Jehovah is my God. Let our names, let us, who we are, represent. God is my salvation. I don't need to run to the right or to the left. I need to stand still and see the salvation of my God. When people ask you, why are you so happy? How can you have peace in this trial? Didn't you just lose such and such? Didn't you just go through such and whatever it is? Didn't you just blow it? Weren't you just where you shouldn't have been? Didn't you just cuss your husband or wife out in a parking lot? And then go into the church. I'm not speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> but I can stand up and say, God is my salvation. The blood of Jesus still speaks over my life. The blood of Jesus still speaks over my life. God, and then you walk in that. I know that we are weak and we are frail and we will mess up. And maybe we've gone in this path of Ahab. And Isaiah, maybe we have. And you know what? God is faithful to show us, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. Hey, that's not going to work for you. Hey, right there, that thing, that's going to bring death in your life. The way you're thinking right there, you got to get rid of that thinking. That's got to go. Don't think like that anymore because my promises are true. My promises are yes and amen. I'm not going to leave you there. Come on, we got to get back up. We got to keep on going. The Holy Spirit is your biggest fan. He is your biggest cheerleader if you're listening for him. I mean, you, you know, you always need like your hype man. Now he's like one of my biggest hype people. But the Holy Ghost is your biggest hype man. He, and you know what? Not only will he hype you up, but he will give you the power. He will give you the power. He said, at the moment of salvation, I have endued you with power. You're not speaking in tongues yet? That's okay. Because you know what? You keep seeking it and he'll fill you. But you keep seeking it and he'll feeking 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 it and he'll you need all that 
that you need. And Elijah and Elijah had a constant adherence, a constant clinging, a constant devotion, a constant steadiness and attachment to the word of God. Despite their faith, despite their circumstance, despite what they went through or their failures or shortcomings. They said, I will not leave you as long as my soul lives. I'm not going to leave you. Elisha clinged to Elijah, which represents Christ. He clinged to him. And he said, I'm not going to leave you. I don't know about you, but I've been there before. I've been there broken and screaming like a two-year-old on the floor saying, God, I'm not going to leave you. I know that everything is he in hell is telling me to leave you. Every everything in hell. I don't know if I shared this last time, but I, the trial that I've been going through has been so dark that literally the enemy has been telling me to go use again. Could you imagine after 12 years going back to, to using? And I literally have been, in, been there and been like, God, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That thing will not give me no release. That thing will not help me. That thing went after I'm done with it. I have to get back up and pick everything back up, and I'll be right back where I was. And the worse, I'll be worse off than where I was. And I, and I said, God, I am not going to go there. I am not going to go there. I am going to cleave to you and your power. And I don't care what it takes. But I know that I know that I know that God has been faithful to me time and time and time again. And you know what? When you cleave to the Lord, his power comes and that thing is released from you. I mean, the stronghold that tries to bring you back into captivity. I don't know what yours is. I don't need to know. But I do know that the enemy is wise enough to use whatever your thing is against you and to set you up. Look, he's the master of the setup plan. He tried to set you up. But God is the ultimate detector of the setup. Okay, his Holy Ghost is faithful to live inside you, to tell you when the enemy is coming in. See, but that happened through prayer. When Elijah, Elijah says, God, open up my servant's eyes that he may see the host around him that is greater than the trial that he faced. Lord, open up his eyes. And you know why he could say that quickly? Elijah had opened up the Jordan. They had come to this Jordan that was long, and it was wide, and it was deep, and it was mucky, and it was muddy. Have you ever found yourself there before facing something that seemingly is absolutely impossible? I'm not going to be able to cross this thing. I'm not going to be able to get over this thing. I'm not going to be able to go through this thing. This thing has constantly, I'm on the brink of it, and this thing has consumed my very being. But Elijah takes the mantle and places it in the water, which is a type and a shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. And it opened up the Jordan, and they walked through on dry ground. God did that more than about three times, if I'm not mistaken, over and over again in the Bible. Opening up, opening up and causing his people to go through. And he did it for Elijah and Elisha. He came through, there was a trial, and then there was God's faithfulness. And he said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. I don't know about you this morning, but I need God to move. I need him to move, and it's not by might. You ain't going to muster it up. Pastor Matt works out a whole lot, and he is strong. But his strength isn't going to get him through a spiritual trial. Okay, women, our good looks ain't going to get us through a spiritual trial. Men, our money is not going to get us through a spiritual trial. Something that God wants to do in our hearts. But the blood of Jesus Christ, when applied to the doorpost, said the death angel shall pass by. 
You and your house. You and your house. Apply the blood to you and your house. And let the death angel pass by. See, I'm walking in the sphere. I know it's funny, but I'm walking in the sphere of God's faithfulness. God, this is who you are. You did it for Elijah. And then you know what? Elijah is at the end. He's about to be, he's about to go up with Jesus. He's about to be translated and he's passing the mantle onto Elisha. Let me tell you, we are the next generation. Those of old, giants of old, are passing the mantle to the next generation. And that's who we are. We are the Elishas that are to remember God's faithfulness to Elijah. And God, you've been faithful. And you know what Elijah, Elijah says, what shall I do for you? And Elisha says, give me a double portion of what you got. Give me a double portion of what you got. I've seen you, I've seen God rain down fire from heaven for you. I've seen God open up Jordans for you. I want that, that spirit that rests upon you, Elijah. I want it to rest upon me. Let that be the cry of our heart, church. God, that we would have a double portion, that we would have an overflowing. There's a trial, and I need more and more and more of you. I need more of you. And then Elijah, he's translated up. And Elisha saw it and cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes and he rent them in two pieces. I want to say this, that was the passing on of leadership, the passing on of the mantle. But you know what? Elisha would have never been ready for leadership, would have never been ready for what God was calling him to if he didn't walk through the trials with Elijah. So we need to pass through some things that God get us ready See, God wants us to remember in the midst of the battle, in the heat of the flame, that we would recall his faithfulness, that we would be faithful to him. Even in the midst of something that seems dark and dim, God, help us to remember your faithfulness. But if you don't go through anything, then you're not going to know. I'm not going to know what God is capable of doing in our lives. I'm not going to know the power to overcome sin if God doesn't allow a trial to come where that sin is in my face. I'm not going to know what it means to be comforted by the Holy Spirit if I was never broken. I'm not going to know what it means for him to bind up my broken heart if, if I would never experienced anything. And look, you're going to experience it anyway. Whether you believe in the Lord or not. But God, when he was, he's cultivating a beautiful relationship with us. And he's saying, I am your peace. In the midst of all the chaos and the confusion, I can be your peace. And then we see, we see now Elisha begins to wa- operate and walk in his footsteps of Elijah. And you know what God brings him to as soon as he takes the mantle? He goes straight to the Jordan. God puts Elisha through the same trial that Elisha was there to see Elijah move in. Listen, be careful what we say about other people because that very thing I've experienced it that very thing that you judge them on will be the very thing you walk up against and then we need to operate in the power of God Elijah now comes up to the Jordan and Elijah can say I remember what Elijah did I remember he called on the power of God I remember that he spoke his word. I remember, I remember, I remember that he opened it up. And he's the same, he's the same for me. 
He's not a partial God. Look, the, one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is to tell you that God ain't going to do it for you. Well, Jess must have been excellently good because God did it for her. There's no way that he's going to do it for me. Did you see the way I acted the other day? Did you see how wicked my heart is? Did you see the thoughts that I thought the other day? Did you see how I treated my child? Did you see how I treated my spouse or my coworker? Did you see how I treated that person on the other line that keeps calling my house trying to collect some bills? Did you, did you see? But God, so based on that, God's not going to do it for me. No, 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 no. God's faithfulness is the same to you as it is to anyone else. And as long as the blood of Jesus and you believe him, God will do the same for you. And that's what happened with Elisha. He said, you know what? Here I am at the brink of the Jordan. Here I am at this trial. But my, I know that the enemy comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus has come to give life and life abundantly. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of instability. He's not going to make you unstable. When you come up to that trial, he's going to make you strong. He's going to make you stand in his power and his might. And you'll say, I've seen Sabrina go through some of the darkest days. And I've seen God walk her through. And he here I am at the brink of my own Jordan, and I'm going to go through too, and I'm going to put the blood of Jesus in it, and I'm going to allow him to move in my life. So God began to work in his power in Elijah's life. He opened up the Jordan for him. The people of God recognized the power of God in Elisha's life. Why? Because he was walking in the sphere of God's faithfulness. See, when you begin to believe God, you continue to walk in the sphere of his faithfulness. And based off your faith, he acts in his faithfulness. Then God began. Elisha comes up to the water of Jericho. It's poisonous. I mean, I'm talking about miracle after miracle. I'm going to shoot through these real quick the water of Jericho was poisonous what are we allowing to be substance in our life is it causing illness in our hearts in our minds in our in our families see the water of Jericho was poisonous and empty and you know what Elijah did he brought a new cruise of oil he bought a new cruise of oil. Do you need a new cruise this morning of oil this morning? Do you need something to put in the water that is bring, bringing poison into our hearts and our minds and lying to you? And that was representative of the body of Jesus. I'm going to place what Jesus has done in my life. And he put salt in it, which represented the word of God. Salt preserves and heals. Salt is a remedy. If you need God to come and heal the waters that you've been swimming in, God wants to heal and bring a remedy to you. And he did that. He placed the cruise of oil. And it said, 2 Kings 2.21, he went forth unto the spring of waters. And cast the salt in. And thus, and thus said the Lord, I have healed these waters. I have healed these waters. I have healed these waters. I have made whole these waters. I have cured these waters. I have mended these waters. I have done what only I can do in these waters. And it says, there shall not be from thence any more death in this barren land. Oh, I don't know about you, but if you have felt like it has been barren and it has been empty, God said, put the salt of the word in your life. Put the blood of Jesus and believe him and I can heal your waters. And then I began to see this. I saw this and I thought this was crazy. I've read this one other time and I didn't remember it. So, as Elijah is leaving, there is 42 teenagers making fun of him. 
And they begin to mock him and scoff him and called him bald head. And bald head does not mean, it didn't mean that he was actually bald. It actually meant worthless man. And how many times have we been believing God and the enemy come in and say, this is worthless. What you are doing is worthless. Your worship is worthless. Your reading of the word is worthless. It doesn't matter. It's not going to help. It's not, it's not going to do anything. You might as well just quit. You might as well just give up. You know what God did? I was like, wow, the Lord was raw back in the day. He's still the same, though. There still a, should be a holy reverence. God sends two she-bears out of the woods, and they maul the children. God is not playing with the enemy when he mocks his people, when he scoffs at his people, when he turns his people's heads. The Lord will send. I couldn't believe it. I was like, Lord, that's, that's pretty intense to send two bears to maul 42 children because they were making fun of the man of God. But then I began to think about this. Isaiah 58 says this, he is near that vindicates. He is near to those that he vindicates. Who will contend? Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let us come near. Behold, the Lord God will help me. I don't know about you, but he is near to those that he vindicates. That means he will avenge you and he will make it right. I don't know what you need today, but God is your avenger. He is your fighter. He will vindicate you. He will help you in time of trouble. It says for those that are contending, that meant grappling. Are you grappling with something this morning? Are you contending? Are you fighting? In a fight that's in, you're engaging in a fight that is close. You're grappling. And he says, no, I'm going to make it right. I will do whatever I need to do. If I need to send some she-bears. You are my woman and you are my man. And my spirit rests upon you. You've been walking in truth. You've been walking in my power. I draw near and vindicate those that are close to me. So that tells me, man, if the Lord's willing to send some she-bears out there, I, I'm all right. You're going to fight for me like that, Lord? I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you to vindicate me. And it, oh, there's miracle after miracle after miracle feeding the hundred. Nahum the leper gets healed and restored. We see the woman, the Shumite's woman, um, son die. The promise of God that he promised the Shumite woman dies. You ever think your promise is dead? Your promise is dead? The same God that gave you the promise is the same God that's going to raise it up. You hear what I'm saying? The same God that gave you the promise, Shua, my woman, puts her son, the dead son, in bed with Elijah, knowing the power of God upon his life, and the son wakes up from the dead. The same God that gave you the promise will do it again. So why do I tell you all this? Because Elijah's life represented him walking in the sphere of God's faithfulness. That didn't mean he didn't see trials. That didn't mean he didn't see the widow with the creditor coming, coming to take all she had. He seen the, the widow woman, lifeless and helpless, but came in and said, what do you have in the house? And she said, nothing but a pot of oil, nothing but the word of God, nothing but the Holy Spirit. I have nothing left but Elijah. Where is God now? And he said, the oil stayed. The oil caused her to stand in the face of the trial. Why do I tell you all of Elijah's life? Why have I brought you through all of these stories? Because God's trial, God's going to allow the trial, but you can walk in the sphere of God's faithfulness. And that's what happened. When we get to 2 Kings 6, 15, they're again going against the Syrian army. So look, God allowed them to go through all that they did. When they got to this part, it said the king of Syria warred against Israel. 
meaning the battle was meant to consume them and bring destruction upon their lives. The enemy means to bring destruction in your life. If there is chaos and confusion and destruction, that is part of the enemy's plan. Syria warred against Israel, not only that, but took counsel, it said. 2 Kings 6, 8. They took counsel, meaning they, the enemy strategically devised a plan to come against Israel for their destruction. And that's his plan today. It also says this, listen to this. In such and such a place shall be my camp. Syria said, I'm going to set up a camp in your family. The enemy says, Mike, I'm going to set up a camp in your family. The enemy says, Pastor Matt, I'm going to set up a camp in your church. The enemy says, I'm going to set up a camp in your mind. The enemy says, I want to set up a camp in your heart. I'm going to set up a camp on your job. I'm going to set up a camp. That's what Syria was saying. I'm going to set up a plan wherever you are that's meant for your destruction. And there's going to be war there. And 2 Kings 6.13 said, and he said, the king of Syria said to his people, go and spy out the land where he is. He's looking for Elisha, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. And therefore sent he horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night. And they compassed about the city. The enemy is always spying you out. Just as much as God knows what you're doing, the enemy knows what you're doing as well. He said, go spy out the land, and I want you to fetch him. Meaning, I want you to carry away God's people. I want you to bring them to me. That's what the devil is saying. He's saying, I want you to bring them to me. Go fetch them. Go get them. Set up camp where they're at. So they feel like they're consumed. And they just quit. And there he sends them out. And he sends them by night. Sometimes it's sneaky, y'all. It's tricky. You don't even see it coming. Maybe you don't even realize it's there. Until maybe it's a little too late. But you know what? God's power is always there to return us back. It says that, that consuming was a circle. It was like circling. Circling. The trial was circling them. And it says the servant of the man of God risen early and gone forth behold. And a host had encompassed the city. See, there was a true trial going on. And the horses and the chariots were there. It was probably loud. And disrupting. And his servant said to him, Alas, master, what shall we do? That's what we should be saying to the Lord. Master, what shall we do? And the servant, he wakes up in this situation, surrounded by this trial. Romans 8, 31 says, And what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, what, what shall we say? What shall we do? What you shall be saying is, if God be for us, then who should be against us? Every lie and tactic, Naya, if I could have you, every lie and tactic and snare that the enemy has set up camp in your life for shall come tumbling down in the name of Jesus. God said, when Elijah says, he says, what shall we do? He said, fear not. They that are with us are more than they that be with you. Fear not. Don't quit. Fear not, it says. Don't allow the enemy to cripple you, to cripple your faith from going forward. Do not allow the enemy to blur your vision. See, God has a vision for you. He has a plan for you and a purpose for you and a hope for you. And the tactic of the enemy is to get you to see the trial that consumes your life. And you say, what shall we do? Well, the Bible says, do not fear. If you will stand with me, I believe that God wants us to redirect our eyes. See, to the host of angels... And the power of God that surrounds us. 
redirect our eyes to the army of God that fights on our behalf. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, covenant God, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around and about Elijah. I don't know about you, but if you have felt like you have been consumed and there is a trial on every side and you feel like the servant and say, what shall we do? I know for me, I pray and I, I want the prayer of Elisha that says, I pray thee open my eyes to the army that surrounds me. Open my eyes to a new vision. Open my eyes to the spirit. Show me in the spirit, God, what you have for me. Show me in the spirit what you're doing. Show me that you fight for me. And I want to invite you up to the altar if that's you today. And we need God to open up our eyes fresh one more time, God, give us eyes of the Spirit for the trial that we face, for the situation that we face, for our children that are facing these times. God, give us a fresh vision this morning. If that's you, I invite you to the altar to pray.